indigenous people have been living in their environments for so long, um, for such a long amount of time that they've uh, observed these processes over time and they've figured out ways to live with the environment. Um, so in regards to fire, as we spoke about in the paper, um, indigenous communities have found ways, and this is, this is evidenced by uh, some of the new practices in U.S. Forestry Service that you see in California, as an example, um, that indigenous peoples are working with U.S. Forestry Service to figure out proper fire suppression management uh, techniques um, and methods to get rid of, you know, extraordinary amounts of fuel that are on the ground due to uh, mismanagement of, of particular environments. Um, so in regards to management as a whole, um, indigenous people understand how to manage their environment or these areas um, effectively. So not only does exploitation actually happen, and for many indigenous communities that might go against the ethics of that particular community in regards to whether or not the community believes that its knowledge should be exploited or should be commercialized. Um, so we know that the risk of exploitation is real and we know that this is in direct contravention with a lot of the ethics of many indigenous communities. And what we determined is that domestic and international intellectual property largely fall short of of being protective of this knowledge for a variety of reasons. Broad brush, this knowledge, or this law, excuse me, has really been developed to protect uh, innovations, and innovations that occurred in a relatively short period of time. So a lot of indigenous knowledge developed over generations um, and over the long term. And so therefore, one reason why oftentimes traditional or indigenous knowledge um, cannot be protected by international property regimes is because of this kind of requirement for innovation or this requirement of a short-term development. 